G'day guys, uh, we, welcome to the uh, October.net user group. Tonight we have a couple of presenters. We've got uh, TJ from Norway doing Visual Studio 2015 and unit testing. And we have Felix doing uh, an open source presentation. And he's from Corp in America. All right, so I'm gonna kick it off and give it to you. Thanks, Adam. Uh, as I said, my name is Terje Sandström. I am a Visual Studio LM MVP uh, from Norway. And for those of you who don't know where Norway is, I made the map. I, uh, since the globe is so big and I'm from the other side of the world, I just added in Norway in the same position as it is on the other side of the globe. So you can see we are pretty far down towards Antarctica or Arctic, it's called. And uh, right now you have 29 degrees Celsius here. And back home we have zero degrees. So it's pretty nice to coming down here. What I want to talk about now is the new features that's coming in uh, with 2015 on unit testing. And um, the one of the features here is the new test generation feature. That was present in the earlier versions of Visual Studio. And, uh, and it has been an ALM Ranger project. It's been available from time to time. And, uh, not much use, but Microsoft are now taking this back into the product. So the use of a unit test generator has been debatable. People using TDD don't like to generate uh, tests from the code, but uh, having a test generator can be also sort of a way of starting off your tests. You, very often when I do coding, I write the skeleton of my code uh, that's the start of it, and then I generate a test, and I flesh out the test, and after I flesh out the test, I go back to my code and make that working. My test will then go red first, and then green after I fleshed out my code. So there is some argument for using a unit test generator. Uh, what you do is you just uh, right-click on uh, the method you want to test on, and then you have a new context menu, create unit test. If you now click on that one, you get up a dialog where you can first choose which test framework you want to use. Microsoft had no before only bother really about MS test, but now we can use for any kind of test framework. And you can use MS test, you can use NUnit, and we show here with NUnit 2, which is the current version of NUnit. Uh, NUnit without the number here, that is the new version which is still in beta, it's in beta 5. You can generate for both of those. You can also generate for XUnit. I just not installed the XUnit stuff here, but if I had installed the extension for that one, you would have got one more item here. And uh, this is an extensible point, so you can just add more things to it. Uh, the NUnit uh, framework is the one I prefer to use. So use that one. You can then also explain, set up what kind of uh, test project you want to have, the format for it, the namespace you want it to be in. Uh, and this is the default values. You can change that as you like. It will remember what you set here to the next time you run off this test generation. Uh, the frameworks, the test generators, extensions for generating, that is extension, V6 extensions, you find them on the gallery. And I assume it, the links there, uh, I'll, I'll put up a blog post later uh, referring to this uh, uh, session with the links directly. But you can just search up any test generator extension, you'll find this one and you'll find the XUnit stuff. Uh, what's that prefix in the URL? The prefix? N unit colon. N unit, that is to, just to say that uh, this is the way to find the N unit stuff, this is the way to find the XUnit stuff. I hope you don't write that into the URL. You don't need to do that. <laughs> it's enough if you start with HTTP. <laughs> okay, uh, so if you now do, do the generation, you will get this kind of test class. It is a simple test class with attributes set up. And you can start to flesh this out. It start out just with a cert fail, and you can now add in the rest of the code you want to have there. The new math stuff, the method you had, you 
the ads of the stuff, you uh, write out a complete assertion that the result is equal to expected and some comment on what it does. Uh, for those of you who don't know NUnit too much, uh, this is the new fluent syntax that is in NUnit. And uh, the normal way of writing unit tests with NUnit before and also MS test is this assert R equal and stuff like that. Uh, that was the way before. The way forward is this fluent syntax. And this fluent syntax is now the basic thing there. The assert R equal are still there. But that is just the wrappers around this one. So this is not the opposite way. And I think this way of writing it is more readable than the assert R equal. It's more clear what it's trying to do. Now, when you have got this uh, unit test in, you need to have it up in the test explorer. And you need to install the end unit test adapter. There are two ways to install test adapters. This is 2013 stuff. 2015 to, uh, has the same way, but you can either use a V6 extension or you can use a, a, new, a NuGet extension. If you use a NuGet extension, the benefit of doing that is that that will be carried along with the project. It will be added to the package config file, and if you build later on a TFS server, it will be picked up there. So using the NuGet test extension, will make your project compile anywhere. Also means that if a developer doesn't have anything installed and the test adapter installed, he will get that along with this project. If you look at uh, another feature of NUnit, picking up here is uh, you can use parameterized test. So now I've fleshed out the test a little bit more. I've added in parameters to it. And I can use a test case thing. It, this means it starts to be kind of a data-driven test. And the test explorer will, in fact, recognize multiple of these and will display them the ordinary way. So the test explorer in its studio knows about parameterized test, even if MS test doesn't have this. Sorry, what was that last thing you said? What's that? I didn't, I didn't get it. The last point you just made. The test explorer knows about parameterized tests. So it will display it, as you can see here. In MS test, this will have to be written by two tests. Here we just add in more parameters to the test. It will be displayed like it is multiple tests. So is it that similar to that uh, data road test? Before? Yes, it's a, uh, kind of similar. You also have the kind of data road test in any unit. Yeah. So you can add in a test data source mm -hmm. and take data from an XML file or whatever. But uh, this is a first step of doing it. I'm using this a lot simply because I want to run the test with a smaller set of data and I get this data straight into my code. Okay. And does that work with XUnit too? XUnit has a similar syntax. And MS test? No. MS tests don't have this feature. Then you have to use the data row as you mentioned. And the data row, that gives, I said, the code is starting to be more clumsy. Using the test case attributes like this, much more smoothly code. You see it directly, no more extra things to write. Okay, this is the first step of what we call data-driven tests. What uh, has been added, which is completely new in 2015, is what they call IntelliTests. The IntelliTest feature, that is also something that TDD people would not particularly like. Because it's the opposite of TDD. But I will assume that most developers have been into the case where they have been given an old project, some old code, and that older code, which was written three months ago by some other developer, did not have unit tests. And uh, you need to change that code. How can it dare to change code without unit tests? 
it will probably not work after you've done it. You may change the behavior. You would not like that behavior to change. The point of IntelliTest is to cover those cases. Uh, if you know about the old PEX framework, it's used, the IntelliTest is the new version of PEX built into a product. So let's see how it looks. Uh, I have a favorite type of uh, demo applications that's about the restaurants. And uh, in a restaurant, you will also need to calculate the bill. And as you'll notice, for, at least for any one of you who has read uh, Douglas Adams' Restaurant to the End of the Universe, uh, you know that, that that calculation can be very hard to do. It depends on different kinds of factors, like uh, the mood of the waiter, uh, how much tips you give, and the calculation is not obvious. So we just, it doesn't add up to the sum. So this is the calculator for the restaurant at the end of the universe type of bill. And if you look at this code, uh, if you want to change this code and refactor it, because this code is not very nice, you will need to first start off by having a unit test covering it. But since you don't really know the algorithm, you don't know exactly how this is working out, then it's time an IntelliTest can help you. So you start off by the same way as with, uh, we did with the creating unit test. You go to the method. Now you use the other function to create IntelliTests. And you get up a similar type of menu, a dialog. Uh, you can now again choose test framework. You can do this with any unit, with X unit, the same thing, MS test if you prefer. And you add in the parameters for stuff. I marked one thing. There's one unfortunate small thing here. If you use uh, this create unit test and create IntelliTest for both things, they have the same parameters for the projects. Which means that you got, if you do first create a unit test project, you get project.tests, the next one will be project.tests.one, dot two, and so on. So I prefer to add something like IT under this one. So you can see that this is an IntelliTest type of project. To see that this IntelliTest project also makes sense because there are certain things that doesn't really work properly in which studio with IntelliTest. Code lens doesn't really recognize them. Code lens is now also available in the, uh, the lower SKUs, so more people have access to code lens. And uh, there are some other things. You will really like to have this in a separate project named so you can easily find it again. Okay, when you start it up, it will create uh, the test and uh, uh, it will create it a simple test project the same way it will include in uh, the package config file. It will also include in the NUnit framework, everything that will be included in the projects. Uh, when you created the test, you get just a skeleton test. There's no content in this test. So you go back to your code and you right click on this one and now you use run IntelliTest. The run IntelliTest starts up this test and this this code and runs through that in uh, it's a proper runner and it runs and explores all the possible paths it can take and finds parameters you can work on so if you try this just on this code it will start to run and uh, it will uh, very often give you exactly this it will give you the information that this is divided by zero exception in this case, and you get up a debugger window in the background. That is something which is a bug in Visual Studio 2015. I've been talking with the product group, and they told me they're working on it. They're working to fix this thing. Pro hopefully, it may be in update one, or it can be even later. I've not heard any status on where to go, but uh, they are working on it. The thing to do with that dialogue is simply to ignore it, just, just drop it, kill it off. You don't want to debug this with the Visual Studio. We can now go in here and take a look at what is done. This that is red, that's okay. Let's just see a divide by zero exception. That's okay. You can choose to ignore it. The best thing to do is simply at this time to run the test and look at the code coverage. 
What we'll see here then is that the code that has been covered in the first run of this test is not all the code. The reason for this is that this test project consists of three parts. It has a factory for creating the test parts. It is the real test class itself. It has a generated part. And the real test itself has this partial code, which is in the test. That is the real, uh, what we call, the starting of the test. Here. And if you now look at the create method, you see that it just starts up the calculator and runs it, and there's added comments to it, that you should edit this factory method. What you should look at when you should edit this is to look at uh, what this code really is doing. And you see it takes in food, it takes in drinks, and it takes in the tips factor, the tip factor. How much do you want to tip the waiter? A factor for that. These parameters is what you need to add into the test. So what you do is to expand this uh, calculator test with these methods. This is the frame, this is the file down here, the partial part of the code, this non-generated code. And you add in the parameters, and this we call with this syntax target calculator build. Here is very sorry, very call the real test method under test. And in the create method, you add in the same methods. You create the calculator and you add in the setting of the parameters from A, B, and C, which is the three parameters we had, food, drinks, and tips. And we do this, then we'll start to get more results out. Now to generate, in this case, eight different things, and we need to just trim this a little bit further down. So now, done the first here, it looks good. The other ones gives divide by zero exceptions and overflow exceptions. And we want to go down to something looking like this. If we look at this test here now, you'll see that the number of waiters is negative. It's a minus uh, 18 million or 187 million or something waiters. This is nonsense data. That's the next thing you need to fix. So you go back into your code, into calculate test, and you add this PEX assume. PEX assume set us preconditions for your test. So add, for example, that food has to be greater than 100, the test factor has to be greater than zero, the number of waiters must be greater than zero, the number of guests must be greater than zero, and the number of tables must be greater than zero. If you add this assumption, which really tells this PEX generator what and how it should generate a test, then you start to get more proper results. And if you now run the entire test again, you see it only gives you four different tests. And these tests have sensible values. And you can also, when you run it, you will get four tests up here, which can be run. And when you then check the resulting code, all the code will be covered. When you go to that stage, where all the code has been covered, then you can start to refactor this code. TJ, yeah. could you step back and just explain that um, PEX assume again? The PEX assume is setting up preconditions for your test. This is the uh, wrapper around your software under test. It's what's calling your target is the uh, target is the software under test. This is the method you're testing on. This is just setting up what the preconditions is before you go in. Okay. So you said, does it make sense? Yeah, I think so. And you just simply state what has to be true in this case. Right, okay. Yes? Um, 
just want to understand then what's the difference between these uh, uh, test cases by passing the different values with this intelligence test. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know what's the difference exactly between. So using the test case method, I can also exactly test by passing the different values. That's I can true. also do the same thing. That's true. And what makes this uh, unique? Exactly. Let's assume that uh, you have a leg that this was legacy code. When it or in the other case, it was your newly written code. It's, it, if it is your newly written code, then you know the algorithm. You know the specifications. Then you have the information and data for adding in the test case, right? But let's assume it was legacy code. You don't know the specifications. You don't know exactly. So what you do is you explore the code instead. So you let the code tell you the specifications. That's what I meant by this as being opposite of TDD. Uh, my question is how these uh, intelligence tests uh, support for injecting. Speak yeah. louder. Yes. Okay. How this support for injecting mock objects, intel uh, intel tests. Um, uh, intel test itself does not use mocking or anything there. But okay. if you add in interfaces mm -hmm. to your methods, yeah, then it will recognize that that are interfaces uh -huh. and it will try to mock those. Okay. It's automatically done because uh, the it's atomically done, but okay. I try to play with it. Uh -huh. uh, then it starts to be harder. Okay. And so all of these interface methods, you need to make a factory for each of those. So okay. they know, so you sort of can create that mock in, in some way. It does something automatically. What is the, uh, if you um, like to go at the, at that blog post, there's a whole set of uh, blogs, it links inside that blog post. It links to several sets of IntelliTest blogs, which among other things, explains how to do exactly what you're asking for. So it's, uh, let's just say my experience with this has been that uh, it can be harder when it grows, but it's uh, pretty good at doing it. And if you write your code the right way, then it does very good. On the other hand, since this is a tool you will most likely use on code that is not as good written because uh, the other guy here wrote it three months ago and that's a long time ago and uh, it didn't have a unit test and it's probably not properly object oriented either, probably didn't use interfaces, then you have a problem. Uh, does that mean it's not a good idea to uh, use uh, intelligent tests in enterprise application developments? Absolutely, I would use an enterprise application development. Okay. Also, there's one other aspect there. If you notice those divide by zero exceptions. Okay. Uh, when you use IntelliTest, it will find conditions in the code which will give the possibility for divide by zero or an overflow exception. Okay. To know about those cases can tell you something about your code. For example, you may experience that when you run this application in real life, it also has the same kind of exceptions. And IntelliTest will show you, yes, it has it. In the, uh, some months ago, there was one bug in any unit, which was found on random attributes due to exactly this thing. It found an, uh, a bug by running IntelliTest. In fact, one of the Microsoft guys did this. He used IntelliTest on any unit, found this, reported that bug in, and it was fixed as a result of simply using IntelliTest to explore the code and see if there was something wrong there. Okay. So that's another use for IntelliTest. So I'm curious, how did that bug, um, that divide by a zero bug, get in when like, your first impression is it wasn't very well tested? It didn't have any unit tests. Uh, the developer have, have tested only the happy paths and haven't tested all the extra cases around there. You can see that so if you go... So doesn't that mean IntelliTest isn't very robust? Yes, that's divide by zero. It's not an IntelliTest. That divide by zero is in your code. Oh, so that means, oh, okay, that's something you've got to fix. Something I got to fix. All of those things we had there earlier. Uh, let me go back, we had... Uh, If 
you look at the code uh, we had earlier here, if you look at this code here, you see we have a, a division here. We have also... We can't see your mouse. Hmm? Where did you see it? The bottom. Yeah, cool. There it is, of course. Yeah. There it is. Divide by number of waiters. And since it's a probably then tried a value of zero, that means that if you go in and add zero number of waiters, then you're off. The same thing if you give a negative number of guests and a positive number of tables so they're instantly equal, then it crashes. In real life, that probably will not happen but it is a vulnerability in your code. And this case is pretty obvious that you won't do it, but in real code it may not be that obvious. So what you see, the areas that we found here, all of them are in your code. Um, I know you use unit tests a lot, but do you use these IntelliTests in any real projects of your own? Yes. And have you enjoyed it? No. <laughs> what, so, yes, I enjoyed using IntelliTest on it, but I hate that I didn't write or s got some other people who were in my team to write unit test earlier, so that we was forced to use IntelliTest for it. And were you able to go back and start refactoring and then remove some yes, of the IntelliTest? Yes, exactly. What we do is we add on uh, the IntelliTest, run IntelliTest on it, and uh, uh, then we have a kind of capsule around that code, so you know they won't inadvertently destroy it. And then you refactor, and uh, when you refactor, of course, write ordinary unit tests. Right, so use IntelliTest to get your code a bit more solid, yeah. and then start refactoring and start removing IntelliTest. Yeah. And in addition to that, the other thing is mentioned, using IntelliTest to simply explore your code and see, is there anything I've forgotten? I have forgotten something here, because IntelliTest can find those parts which seem to have forgotten. Like notice in the code here, I didn't really see the divide thing, it was further down. That happens all the time. In more than four lines of code in a method, you get blind. So TJ, just two quick questions. Given that this was a Microsoft research project originally, so yeah. 2008 timeline, why would I want to use IntelliTest today, given that it's still pretty much the same underlying PEX engine? And what's the benefit of using this white box uh, testing approach versus black box testing with a standard fuzzing algorithm? Okay, the first question you had, uh, why would you use it today, instead of since it was uh, so long, uh, well, they have changed it, they have baked it into being a product and they're actively engaging and working on it. Uh, PEX was kind of nearly working because it was a Microsoft research project. So uh, PEX, I used PEX at that time and it arrived and tried to get things out. It was a lot of fun, but uh, a lot of frustration. And it was, didn't really feel that the product group would start and work with it and get really involved in it. So it just stayed that research projects. And uh, when the product groups now really have taken care of it and engage in it, then the code becomes more robust, the feature becomes more ro robust, bugs will be fixed, and so on. The quality bar of releasing something from Microsoft Research and putting in the product is a, is a big yeah. difference in the quality well, bar Microsoft yeah. have got to pass. And the second question was? What's the advantage of using the white box testing methodology that's part of PEX versus black box testing with a, say, something like Peach Fuzzer? Well, like what did you say? I didn't know that framework. Uh, so, given that PEX is looking at the internals of a method, it's white box testing. So essentially, it's not really all that different from TDD, given that we do know the internals of the method and we can see the source code. So, in real terms, there's mm. not a lot of difference there other than you have a engine that's giving you automatic uh, parameters and trying to test for known bugs, essentially overflows, those types of things. So what's the advantage of using PEX or using um, yeah. what, what IntelliTest versus using black box testing? Yeah, if you're using black box testing, you don't... Uh, what IntelliTest does is it, as I said, it gives, uh, runs the exploration of the code. 
So you start without knowing anything about specification. If you do black box testing, you need to know what you're testing for. What are your assertions? You need to know what is the real the positive outcome and when it should fail. With IntelliTest, you don't know that up front. You don't know what causes your code to fail. It finds those parts of it. So to me, it is, uh, uh, I would not say that you will use IntelliTest for all your testing purposes. That's completely defeats the purpose. I will use it for code pieces where I either is unsure about the algorithm, if it covers everything I, I would like it to do, because it is complex for some reason. I will use it on legacy code. Uh, I will not attempt to use it on simple code where I don't really know about it. That broken in any unit which was found, that code looked in fact a bit simple, but uh, it, what it did find was uh, divide by zero exceptions and overflow exceptions. And uh, the ability of Intel test to find those kinds of exceptions is pretty valuable. You don't do that with a black box testing, since you must know the outcomes. Made sense? So I'd like to ask you a question that, um, assuming you've got a new team, they know MS Test, and they're considering using um, the, another framework, such yeah. as NUnit, why should they choose NUnit over built-in MS Test? Because Tell me the arguments you would give them. There are several reasons for doing it. First of all, starting off with MS Test is, is great. And there's a lot of companies having MS Test and using that for a long time, that's fine. And it's starting to do somewhat more advanced. MS Test lack those features. And uh, to my knowledge, there, there hasn't been any real development of MS Test as a test framework. It has evolved in different variations for different platforms. They have done things with it. They have done things to copy coded UI tests and stuff like that. So there are, in fact, different MS test runners and underlying different test MS test frameworks. But what we as developers know about MS test as the real core of it is the same today as it was six, seven, eight years ago. Unit is evolving all the time. XUnit has been evolving all the time. Uh, so the investment in MS test has been lower. There is coming evolvement Involvement of the, what you said, the test framework itself, which is above MS Test, but that also applies to any unit and X unit. So the Test Explorer is being enhanced. There's coming now new features for, uh, for running uh, different kinds of tests, uh, sending parameters down to tests and stuff like that. And uh, but that will apply to all of these test frameworks. It's not MS Test specific. So the, the main is there's no fluent. Uh, syntax in um, MS test. There is no uh, uh, parameterized test, which is extremely useful. Uh, there's a lot of other features it completely lacks, which makes the test more efficient. And one good thing, uh, if you go for .NET Core and ASP.NET 5, then the only test framework you can use currently is XUnit. NUnit is very soon there. They are working now with the framework itself. Uh, and I know that Microsoft guys are helping out with me, uh, moving an unit up. I have not heard anything about MS Test coming into that range. I will assume they would do something to get it up. I haven't heard anything about it. I haven't seen anything yet. So the focus seems to have been X unit, then N unit, and then they end MS Test. Okay, a related question. A team is considering not using MS Test but using X unit or N unit, mm. what are the pros and cons of which way you'd go, like specifically? The, if the, you have a series of developers who have been using MS Test before, the way to go from MS Test to N unit is very, very short. You can more or less, uh, this is the attributes are more or less the same. Uh, the syntax is very, very equal. Uh, XUnit has a different syntax. And uh, it can be a bit steeper curve on XUnit. And XUnit also has less flexibility than any unit. Uh, regarding speed and stuff like that, they have tested these things and 
this test more or less shows that these test frameworks are more or less equal. Your speed is not getting anything on this, so you can choose. It's more like a kind of preference. So if you have a new team, you should have been just doing a bit with XUnit, feel free to continue with it. It has a simple syntax. It is designed to be very simple, clearly very object-oriented. NUnit is designed to cover more ground, to be able to do more different kinds of stuff. Personally, I've been using all of these test frameworks, and I'm staying more and more with NUnit. Because in practice, if you work with a mixture of enterprise code, legacy code, uh, different kinds of projects, then NUnit is perfect in that mix. Like it scales very good from both with regards to the developers and with technology. We got a last question, I think. So, uh, using NUnit, can we test uh, private methods? Because with uh, MS Unit, we can, like, uh, test private uh, test in private methods. I'm the writing unit test for private methods. Is it possible in the NUnit? Main, the main guy behind NUnit is a guy named Charlie Poole. He's a great guy. And uh, he's very strongly in favor of TDD and uh, um, object-oriented code. Uh, it's not possible to force him to add testing or private methods. Okay. <laughs> I've not even attempted to do it. So the answer is no, any doesn't do it by design. They want you to uh, either have to make that method uh, protected, for example, and you can just add another class where you can expose it. Uh, then you don't expose it in your product code, but you can expose it to other classes. That's a fair way of doing it. And frankly, if you look at it from another perspective, that the users of your code are at least two users. It's the real user accessing your code, which needs these methods public, and then it's your test. If you have some kind of private method which needs to be private uh, because of production code, but it might need to be public due to your test code. <coughs> so make it public. Pr that is pragmatic unit testing. Not a religious way. Yeah, so if I read a framework or something, Hold on. Sorry. Mm. So say if I build a framework, right? So in that case, uh, if I don't want to expose any, any logic accessible no. to uh, accessible by external people. Mm. So in that case, uh, I knew I had to come up with the private methods, right? Yes, Still, and then I'll say, if you're building a framework which will be used by many people yeah. in different contexts, I would say that the way you test it is by testing its public methods. Okay. And simply not testing the private methods. It doesn't really make sense. Okay, fine. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Okay. Can I take my last slide, Adam? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, TJ.